Good morning, everybody. Please stand. You guys ready to worship? One of us is. Woo. <laughs> All right. Let's worship our great God. This morning, this morning in worship, uh, devotions and prayer ahead of time, we were talking about how the act of worship for God himself, just not for us to feel better, not for us to, you know, kind of like get the feels, but for God, for his pleasure, that worship is what we want to bring to him. Um, put him on his throne and just give him what he's worthy of. So let's do that this morning. You guys ready? All right.
always been true. Saints throughout the ages have relied on that. This song was penned many, many years ago by a saint named Martin Luther. It's true to this day. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood. Of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and dark with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His name, from age to age the same. And He must win the battle. And though this world with devil Should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath will His truth to triumph through us. Good sound kindred, we tremble not for Him, His rage we can. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail. That word above all earthly powers. No thanks to them. The Spirit and the gifts are ours Through Him who is the Sire Good and kindred go This mortal life also The body they may kill God's truth abides in This is our God. Oh, my deep fortress is our God. His kingdom is forever. Oh, my deep fortress is our God. His kingdom is hey. forever. Oh, my deep fortress is our God. His kingdom is forever. His kingdom is forever. If we in 
our own strength can find. Our striving would be losing. Your kingdom is forever, Lord. Jesus, you reign on the throne. Jesus, you are Lord forever. And Lord, uh, as we worship you, we even need to be carried along by the strength that the Holy Spirit provides. We need to be spirit-led believers. We need to keep in step with the Spirit of God. So this morning, Spirit, we need a fresh filling, please. We need to glorify God for who he is in all his magnificence. We glorify you, God. You are good. You are mighty. You are holy. You are the Lord of hosts. You are the King of kings, the fairest of 10,000. And you rule. Amen. goes before heaven like incense rising
Can you turn the effects off on that? <laughs> you are so worthy of it all. <clears throat> Psalm 145, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most, most worthy of praise. <clears throat> no one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor. 
and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He shows compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all that he does. It's such a privilege this morning to gather and to lift up our praises to you. It's a privilege to join our hands, our hearts together and lift you high this morning. You are so good and deserve all the glory and honor throughout your kingdom, <clears throat> throughout this earth. And the great thing is you, you know each one of us by name. You're, you're, a, you're a God that is involved in every aspect of our life. You know and you love us. We just, uh, we just revel in the thought that, you, that you're so close to us. Lord, we lift up uh, our churches this morning. We think of Joy Christian Center with Pastor Brian, Lord. We just ask that you would bless them, bless him, uh, pray that your spirit would fill that body and they would reach many with the gospel, Lord. Uh, we lift up uh, Harvest Ministry Gold in the Fire, Lord. We pray for them, their leaders, as they reach out, inspire lives love on people. Lord, we lift up uh, the, our missionary of, of the month organization, PRC. Lord, we pray for them as they rescue the lives of little ones. They, uh, they're also able to counsel many, give them good advice in a world that doesn't provide a lot of good advice. They give good advice on how to move forward with, with uh, difficult situations. We lift up those in our body this morning, Lord, that need, uh, need help, which is all of us, Lord. But we think of those that have uh, problems in their relationships. Pray that you would give them hope and a desire to, to make it right to forgive, to uh, fix whatever's broken with the power of your spirit, Father. Pray for those that need uh, a healing touch. We continue to lift up Patty Blonsky uh, with her battle. Uh, Brittany Fletcher, and Susie Gordon, and Rachel Ahrens, Lord. We just lift up each one of these ladies and ask that you would touch their bodies, make them well, encourage them, strengthen them in their inner person. We know because the, uh, of what they, they're dealing with now, Lord, we just ask that you would grow them through these experiences. We ask for complete healing, but through the process that you would grow them. Somehow you use these struggles to to make us better people, Lord. We just ask for that. Lord, we pray for patience and John Fleck as they uh, mourn the loss of, of patience, Grandma. Pray for them, too, as they minister to family members that don't know you. We lift up Barb Satsu this morning. Uh, we just pray for her, strengthen her body. We pray that uh, just that uh, whatever's going on there, that you would touch her and heal her. Lift up Pastor Larry as he brings us your word this morning. Uh, just give him a special anointing 
that he would speak your word. He would hear from you as he's prepared and now uh, delivers the message that you've given him. Prepare our hearts as we, as we receive that. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Phil Rockensock, one of the elders here. Welcome for those uh, who are online. We wish you were here. Boy, we got home. My, my wife and I, we were on a little vacation, and we got home, drove up the driveway, and we looked, and there was just the chimney of our house. Couldn't, couldn't see the house at all. I mean, we got some snow. Now, there's a little exaggeration, but you get the point. We got lots of snow. Wow. Isn't Minnesota great? Okay. Ladies, just a reminder that women's Bible study, <clears throat> What Love Is, is starting up the week of the 23rd. Study books are available for purchase in the foyer following worship. If you have any questions, Tracy Rodriguez, are you here? Raise your hand, contact her if you uh, need help. Get a book. Uh, Motley, uh, Molly is planning to de-decorate the church <clears throat> of its Christmas decor following worship next Sunday, January the 22nd. She could use some help. If you're able to stick around and lend a hand, please RSVP on Harvest News or at harvestmn.com events. Uh, Molly, are you here? Anyway, let Molly know that you're willing to help. Uh, next, not next Sunday, our celebration service is coming up. We celebrate all that God has done in the past year. Uh, he's been so good, and we look forward to what he's going to do in the next year, this new year. It's on January 29th, two weeks from today. On that day, we'll hold our annual business meeting. We're going to vote to ratify the budget. There are copies of the budget at each doorway. Uh, pick one up if you would like to go through that. And we're going to also be uh, voting on two, uh, four new deacons. Bill Eikoff for treasure. Molly Oliver, decor and design. Tracy Rodriguez, women's ministry. And Elizabeth Sakewich for evangelism. Uh, if you have questions or concerns about either the budget or new deacons, please talk to one of the elders between now and the meeting day. Uh, the morning will conclude with a potluck. That's going to be fun in the gym next door. More details to follow. Yeah, pick up a, a copy of the budget and peruse it before the meeting. Or if you... Don't want to peruse it, just look through it. But uh, at this time, we got a video to finish up. For more information on what's happening around here, or just to explore more about who we are, you can go to harvestmn.com. There, you will also be able to sign up for our weekly email newsletter, Harvest News. If you are a guest today, we invite you to take a minute to fill out our online connection card at harvestmn.com. Simply click the connect button and fill out the form. We also have a paper option located in our seat back pockets and at both entrances. We encourage everyone to take part in smaller gatherings we call life groups, where you can find lifelong friends, break bread together, pursue spiritual growth, worship, and pray together. God shows up in special ways in life groups and you don't want to miss out. To find a life group that fits your schedule, or if you have any questions, you can reach out to Pastor Dan or contact our office at 320-529-8838. We greatly value being able to worship the Lord through giving, and we appreciate how He consistently provides through faithful people. You can deposit your tithe or offering in a box located at either entrance, or you can give online at harvestmn.com, through Harvest News, or by downloading the Vanco mobile app on your phone. Now let's take time for some fellowship. We want everyone to feel at home here, so reach out and welcome those around you. Go help yourself to a cup of hot coffee out in the foyer, and the music will call us back when it's time for the sermon.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship. Nice shirt. Now, you like that. Now, did you see my bobblehead? Did, it, did everybody notice Jefferson here? Okay. There's a point to this. Good morning. It's great to see you all. And uh, if some of you didn't know, there is a football game going on later today. And uh, so there's a lot of purple in the crowd, which is great. Um, but we'll explain this later. I do want to let you know we are now working with uh, a group uh, that we've worked with in the past for a trip to Israel and Greece in 2024. And so we got some of the preliminary stuff. It's going to be mid-May of 2024. Some of the more details will be coming shortly, perhaps a brochure and all that stuff very, very soon. But just to keep you on uh, post, it, come and talk to me a little bit. If you want to know more information, if you're interested, let me know. And, uh, but we're looking forward to that. That's uh, coming up. Okay, there was a word, um, a picture, uh, and uh, let's see if I, can, uh, if I can remember here. The word was the time for the second return of Christ is set. Obviously, God has his plan, right? But there are some even here that aren't ready yet. And, uh, and, and the word would be, why wait? Get ready. It's, uh, now's the time, okay? It, and it'll, it kind of fits with my message, too, so keep that, keep that thought. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. And uh, we believe that you're in complete control. The... Uh, Book of Revelation says that Jesus is the ruler over the kings of the earth. And so we can be settled on the fact that Jesus, you will return and we can rest in you, even in the midst of the turmoil and struggles and difficulties of our life. We thank you for that. Our prayer is if there's anyone who's not ready yet, they haven't trusted you, they haven't placed their faith in you and begun to walk with you, that you'd draw them today, and also that you'd help us become more mature. Help us, Lord. Teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you will, let's see here. Is it on? There we go. If you will, uh, we're going. We're going to look at First Corinthians chapter three, verses one through four. That's page six hundred and forty-seven in the Bibles that we give away. So if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. It's our gift to you. Take it home. Uh, encourage you to read the Bible. Uh, for, we're going through the book of First Corinthians, verse by verse, and today we're at this question of the problem of immaturity that Paul confronts the Corinthians with. Um, while we're turning to that and contemplating this, there's a question that we want to ask in a kind of a comical way, I suppose. Is your faith in kindergarten? Okay. So watch this. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. I'm just very successful yes. here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? A B. But don't. I mean, C in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. 
I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. It's really good. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still, still hungry. hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? Nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes letter Y too. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. Okay. Is Good your morning, faith Ryan. in car kindergarten? I want you to imagine. Oops, I better advance here, huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, imagine a church that's on fire, reaching the lost, discipling the saved, setting the captives free, healing the sick, praising God together, okay? Do you think Satan would just kind of sit back? and just let all that happen without a fight? Okay. What is his strategy? Is In our passage, we will see two things Satan attempts to do to the church at Corinth. We're going to see other parts of his strategy as we go through Corinthians as well. But two things stick out in this, uh, in this passage here. He seeks to keep believers immature, first of all, and then he tries to bring about division, which is a fruit of immaturity, okay? So let's look at our passage now in, uh, if well, I don't want to go back, it'll bring up the, uh, the video. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you're still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? Uh, let me read from Gardner's commentary on this. He says, the contrast formerly, before in chapter 2, the contrast formerly was between those who were believers, the spiritual, and those who are not, the unspiritual. Now this contrast is between what spiritual people, believers, ought to be and how they actually appear in Corinth. They are part of the family, but they have a lot of growing up to do. Okay, so let's look at the problem of immaturity. Everybody likes kids, right? Well, if you don't, you should, because kids are great and awesome, aren't they? Right, okay? And, uh, and I love our kids. I like actually hearing them as I'm preaching, because it tells me there's life in this church, and that's a good thing, okay? Uh, um, uh, although I do know that sometimes for the parents, it's a little like, oh, you know, they, they, they struggle with it far more than everybody else. So relax, okay? It's okay. Uh, we do have nursery from zero to five years old, but, uh, but I love having the kids in the church. So that's just my, my thoughts, okay? So, but we do all want them to grow up, don't we? You know, in their time, in the right amount of time, we want them to grow up. And so he, that's what Paul's saying here. He wants the Corinthians to grow up spiritually. And first in verse 1 here, we see that immature Christians are like babies. Look at chapter, verse 1. It says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. 
So he had to treat them like babies because they hadn't grown up when they were supposed to grow up. Now, verse 1 is pretty negative, isn't it? You know, some parts of the Bible are negative, and we have to deal with this, okay? Uh, He is being confrontational with them because the Corinthians had tremendous potential in advancing the kingdom of God. Uh, If you remember what he said at the very beginning of the book in chapter 1, Verse 7, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. Tremendous potential there. But instead of working together, they were fighting with each other. And, uh, and that's tragic. Now, as we look at this first verse, let's make sure we know these people are Christians. It specifically, he addresses them as brothers and sisters, and he even says they are babies in Christ. They are in Christ. They have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because they have repented of their sins and placed their faith in Christ and him alone for their salvation. They've outwardly confessed that faith in baptism. And so they're true believers, so we don't think of these people as unbelievers or people who think they're believers when they're not. These are true believers. They are Christians, but they're acting like non Christians. That's the problem. Um, he says in the NIV, uh, I, or I, no, I think our, our passage here says, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people. Uh, people of the flesh is another translation, or still worldly is how the NIV puts it. The King James says they're carnal. Okay, Carnal Christians. Uh, Ryrie states, to be carnal means to be characterized by things that belong to the unsaved life. So they haven't grown up. They're acting like unbelievers. Uh, Gardner again says, they are behaving as thoroughly immature Christians. For those who term themselves mature, now to hear themselves referred to as babies would surely have stung. But they are behaving with one another in the sort of inconsiderate and aggressive way that is so typical of immature children. Just as young children will often leave others out of their games, so the Corinthians exclude each other and put each other down. Kind of like Rudolph. Wasn't allowed to play those reindeer games. Anyway, so they're, they're babies, these people, but these people are Christians. Uh, and he's not addressing whether they're getting the gospel wrong at all. He's addressing their immaturity. They are babies that have not grown up. Uh, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. Not grown up. Could you imagine? Uh, I mean, we all love babies, but imagine if they didn't grow. If they didn't grow up, that's, that'd be tragic, wouldn't it? Well, that's how Paul's feeling about them. They're supposed to have matured, gotten out of kindergarten. And, uh, and yet, they're not. So, we all love babies, right? But there are some negative attributes of babies, right? For instance, they're helpless and dependent on others. So as we grow up, we're not supposed to be helpless and completely dependent on others, right? Okay? They expect to be the center of their world, right? Okay? Uh, They live according to feelings, and they complain a lot. Okay. okay, That's what the Corinthians were like. That's what Paul's addressing this group. And we see here that immature Christians can only drink milk. Look at verse 2. I gave you milk to drink, 
not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready. So he gave them milk. Um, there's a, one other passage in the Bible that's really very similar to this, probably a slightly different group that he's talking to, etc., but very similar. So I, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, because it helps us understand milk and solid food, what's going on here. So look at Hebrews chapter 5. The writer of Hebrews, uh, some people think it was Paul. I disagree personally. I don't think it was Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. I think there's some good evidence against that, but it was probably somebody close to Paul. I, I actually lean towards the possibility of Luke being the writer of Hebrews, but it doesn't say who it is, so we're not really sure, but it sounds a lot like Paul. I'll, I'll give him that. Now, look at verse 11 here. It says, we have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Okay. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and and evil. Now here he's talking about milk and solid food and he's indicating a couple things about what each of these mean. And so let's well let's keep this passage in mind as well as we keep our passage in mind. First of all, milk. Milk is good. It's great on cereal. Okay. Yeah, milk is good. He's using this, he's not using the term milk in a derogatory sense. Milk is good. It is the original gospel message. It's the basics of the Christian faith. That's good. We need that. He's not saying that's not good, but he is saying you can't just stay there, okay? Meat is important. And uh, meat is, now, in the passage in Hebrews, he actually indicates a little bit of what the meat might be. Uh, at the end of the passage, he talks about being able to know righteousness and discern from good and evil. So it's biblical ethics that, uh, that we, uh, he recognizes here, that you're able to discern that. By the way, I'm going to be teaching a class starting in... Uh, uh, actually, March, uh, just a six-week class on Sunday evenings on biblical ethics. So two-hour class, it'll be a pretty good thorough class if you're interested on, on that. But here we see in Hebrews, he says uh, that it's for those, those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. But there's something else about the solid food as well. If you notice back in the passage, verse 11, he says, we have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you become too lazy to understand. Well, what is the this that he's talking about? That's why it's important to see the context of the passage. The first few, first 10 verses of the book of, of chapter 5 in Hebrews, he was talking about Jesus being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So what he was talking about was good doctrine who Jesus is, how he was our great high priest and offered the sacrifice for our sins. And so we see this, this doctrine that he wanted to go more into, more thoroughly to help these people, but they weren't ready for it. They couldn't eat the meat. Now, babies, um, you try to feed them steak and they might throw it up, real, real little babies, but you know, you, you do want to get them eating steak very soon. 
you, you get the illustration here, okay? Uh, in our passage, uh, it might not be referring specifically to doctrine, but it is talking about deeper and deeper understanding of God's word and his plan for your life with the accompanying fruit that's supposed to come as we mature, the fruit of the Spirit. So another passage that really ties all this in together is Ephesians chapter 4. Look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. 1 Corinthians, I've been discussing, uh, arguing that this whole book was written to prepare the people since they had the spiritual gifts how to use them appropriately to advance the kingdom of God. In other words, we all have a part to play in advancing the kingdom of God. Everybody gets to play. We're supposed to find our part and get involved, start doing the work of the ministry together, okay? Uh, But immaturity hinders that. Look at what he says here in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So he gives us the leaders. Why? Verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So the leaders equip the saints to do the work, right? So who does the work? The saints. Who are the saints? All the believers, yes. So the leaders, so do the leaders do all the work? No, the leaders equip the saints to do the work, and that's how the kingdom is advanced properly, okay? So uh, then he goes on to say, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So there's that unity God wants to unite us as a church as we grow up in Christ. Then, see verse 14? Then, I have that underlined. You should, if if you mark in your Bibles at all, some people don't do that. They think the Bible's, I don't know, whatever, but mark in it all you want. Okay, I have an underline. Then, when we are united and and are mature, we've been equipped by the leaders, we're actually doing the work, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. You won't be deceived by the false teachers. And there are a lot of them out there. Uh, and that's and and he's very concerned about this. We're, we don't want to stay babies because that makes us vulnerable to being deceived by false teachers. Instead, speaking the truth in love. I love that verse because we're supposed to speak the truth. We can't just pretend, you know, I don't want to say anything that might hurt somebody or whatever. We have to speak the truth, but you got to speak it in love. You actually have to care for the people that you're talking to, and that love should come out in your teaching. So speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So here he uses the analogy of the body. The church is the body, just like he uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The church is the body. We all have a part. We're all a, you know, a ligament or whatever, and we all have a part. And when we're actually all using our parts properly, that's when the whole body grows up. So that's the ideal. Milk is good. Meat is important. And we, so we have to grow up in this. Now, uh, Adriel Sanchez gives us three signs of spiritual immaturity, okay? First of all, spiritually immature Christians are gullible to strange doctrines. That's what we just saw in the, uh, uh, both the Hebrews as well as the 
um, Ephesians passage. Spiritually immature Christians aren't able to play nice with other believers, okay? <laughs> We're supposed to play nice, okay? No shooting of the spit wads and that kind of thing, okay? Um, and spiritually immature Christians are controlled by their fleshly impulses, their feelings. And, uh, and so we see uh, what a spiritually immature person is. So Finally, though, in verses 3 and 4, we see immaturity produces bad fruit. And this is why it's so dangerous and so bad. Look at back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Because you're still worldly, for since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, Aren't you not, are you not acting like mere humans? Immaturity produces bad fruit. They were behaving like mere humans, it says, living like unbelievers. They weren't the superheroes they're supposed to be. Did you know that God actually has a plan for you? I mean, an incredible plan. You got to think way above what you actually think the plan is because he has this grand plan for each and every one of us. And as we saw before at the end of chapter one, God deliberately chooses the nobodies of the world to wow the world because if he can use us nobodies, then that he gets glory, doesn't he? But you've got to be convinced of that. Every single one of you. You are supposed to be a superhero, not behaving like mere humans. I love the way the, the uh, CSB translates that. Uh, it's actually technically walking like men, something like that in the actual Greek there, but behaving like mere humans. Bad fruit hurts the church and it makes God sad. Paul's actually picking up where he left off in chapter 1 concerning division in the church, where some were picking Paul and others were picking Apollos, like little kids who try to get their parents to choose sides. Have your kids ever done that? Okay, they kind of try to get in between mom and dad and divide. That's, uh, that's what they were doing, okay? Um, he mentions two rotten fruits here. First of all, jealousy. Jealousy. Zealos is the Greek word. It can mean zeal in a positive sense, or in a negative sense, it means intense negative feelings over another's achievement or success. That's the uh, Bible dictionary BDAG, if you're interested. So intense negative feelings over another's achievement or used in Romans 13, 13. Should be just the book back to the left one book. Romans 13, 13. He says... Let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promis promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy. He uses it in 2 Corinthians 12, 20. That's the book on the right side of 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. He says, for I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want, and you may not find me to be what you want. Perhaps there will be quarreling, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Uh, and that's, that's what is not supposed to happen. Okay, now, the illustration. Sometimes I get mad when the Packers win. Okay. All right, and um, and and that's that's sometimes at least because of it negatively affects the Vikings' success because they're in the same division, and so that's understandable. That's not the part I'm trying to talk about. 
But sometimes I just don't want them to win. I don't want them to enjoy success. And that's wrong. That's jealousy. I sometimes get so carried away, I blame the refs. At my house, we have flags, you know, <laughs> flags. When I see a penalty, when the refs do something that I know is wrong, challenge it. <laughs> and it's Jefferson bobblehead, I just like him. It really doesn't fit the... Uh, illustration that much. But you, you get the point, okay, so, so we have to be very, very careful about those kinds of feelings. Now, that's one thing, but, um, and some of it's just fun, I admit, okay, but some of it is really jealousy. This kind of attitude is a million times worse when it's felt towards other believers in the same church. Um, look at Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. Luke's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, But I say to you who listen, love your enemies, do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Um, that's how we're supposed to treat our enemies. The unbelievers that are persecuting us. How much more are we supposed to do this towards our believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, cheer each other on. Think well of each other. Uh, Know that we're all on the same side and we all have each other's best interest in mind. You know, by the way, that's good advice for couples too. If you're married, sometimes if you're going through some struggles, you might start thinking, well, my spouse really doesn't uh, have my best interest in mind or they really meant this when they said that. Have you ever done that? Okay, that's the enemy. He wants to divide us. He wants us to think poorly about each other. God wants us to th give each other the benefit of the doubt, to think well of each other, to build each other up, especially couples. Build each other up. Think well. Satan wants you to think poorly, but God wants you to see just how wonderful your spouse really is, how he thinks of him or her, okay? Um, so we have jealousy. The second thing that's mentioned is strife. Back in our passage, if you notice here, he says uh, that because you are still worldly, for since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? The Greek word there is eris, strife, quarreling, discord. It is the opposite of unity, and unity, when, he, when Paul, we already saw this as well, when Paul's talking about unity in the body of Christ, he's not primarily talking about all the churches throughout the world. There is something to that that we need to be united in certain ways, etc. But that is not what he's addressing, and we know that. So just skip back to chapter 1 and look at this again, okay? Verse 10, he says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. Uh, I like the NET translation, united with the same mind and and purpose. We don't have to think and believe absolutely everything completely alike, but we do believe in the basics of Christianity and we have the same purpose and we're united together. But this verse is not talking about other churches. It's talking about the local church at Corinth. 
So this church here at Harvest, We're supposed to be united without this strife that's going on, okay? Uh, Unity in the local church is the primary focus that most of the time when the Bible addresses unity, that's what it's talking about, okay? So there's the bad fruits. What are are good fruits, (laughs) okay? We we do want to... And on a positive note here, okay, what are good fruits, okay? First of all, a developing Christian character uh, is is good fruits. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. This is the fruit of the Spirit that uh, right after 2 Corinthians, you got Galatians chapter 5, fruit of the Spirit. By the way, just before that, he gave the fruits of the flesh, the works of the flesh. But let's focus now on the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to build in us, love, joy, peace, patience with each other, okay, patience, Kindness. It's good to be kind. Goodness. Faithfulness. We're using our spiritual gifts for each other. Gentleness and self-control. By the way, if you struggle with addictions, and that's one thing I love about our church, we are reaching out to people and we bring in and accept everybody, okay? You, you are welcome here even if you've got addictions, because we know the one who can set you free. It's what Jesus wants to do. But we also know that's a little messy too, okay? You, you don't, you, so we need to grow, and we need, it's the Holy Spirit who actually produces this. So as you spend time with Christ in the body of Christ and actually experience the Holy Spirit in your life, you'll start to see the addictions fall off. Okay, that's good news. So we have a developing Christian character. Second Peter brings some of that out as well. Right conduct is called a fruit in Colossians 1.10. Uh, conversions through our witnessing, that's a fruit. As we share our faith, people get saved. That's a fruit. Worship, it's called the fruit of the lips, worshiping God. That's fruit where you, you're not just singing the songs. You find yourself actually talking to God, wanting him to be glorified. As Aaron brought out at the very beginning, it's it's really not about us and our feelings, though we do experience incredible feelings when you're in the presence of God. You know, and God inhabits the praises of his people, so there's incredible feelings. But you don't do it for the feelings. You do it because... You're just enamored with God, okay? And that's, as you're growing, that's a fruit of, uh, a good fruit of, of maturity. And uh, Romans 15, 28 brings out giving money is a fruit, okay? So how can we be more fruitful? Now here's the hard part, okay? The first one, I want you to turn to John chapter 15, is pruning. John 15 Jesus makes this statement, beautiful statement about being in Christ. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. So, He doesn't want us to just produce a little bit of fruit. He wants us to produce a lot of fruit, but we have to be pruned in order to make that happen. Here's a quote. It says, In pruning, the wise and loving vine dresser removes all useless things that would sap the strength of the branch and keep it from bearing more fruit. But pruning hurts, doesn't it? Okay. But it's necessary for growth. It can include discipline, Hebrews 12, 5 to 12. It could include physical limitations at times, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. It could include material losses 
Hebrews 12, 10, 34. It could include unjustified persecution, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. He can use those. He doesn't cause them, but he can use those things to bring about more fruit, which is what we want, right? So, so pruning is one way that we can be more fruitful, but then he goes on in the John passage, abiding, abiding in Christ. He goes on, verses 4 and 5, remain in me. Now, by the way, meno is the Greek word there, and other translations say abide in me. I like abide better than remain. It does mean both, okay? So they're both accurate translations, but abide says so much more than just remain. It means experience the present the uh, personal relationship. It means go deep into the personal relationship. Abide in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Okay? Abide to dwell in intimate fellowship, resting in Christ, enjoying his presence, soaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. As you're abiding in him, he equips you, he strengthens you, he takes off all the garbage that's holding you back. He empowers you. He leads you. And then the next thing you know, you're doing the stuff of the kingdom that you thought you'd never do. This is God's plan, okay? So, so we have here abiding. We want to produce this fruit. Now, I want you to imagine what Paul is feeling as he's writing these first four verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's hurting for the church. He loves them. He wants, he sees the potential in the church at Corinth because it had all the gifts evident. And he already stated that in chapter 1. But he sees the church struggling because of the jealousy, strife, and division. It's like a race car with broken wheels. It's like a fishing pole with the line tangled up in the reel. It's just not going to work as well, right? Uh, it's like a house in Minnesota in the wintertime with the furnace broken. <laughs> These are, this is what he's seen. This is how Paul's feeling. God's admonition to us is to grow up a perpetual state of immaturity is bad for everyone involved. And we want to help you follow Jesus and share him with others. Let's pray. Watch out for my flags. Father, every one of us confess that we are not where we should be and that we've practiced laziness at times and we've certainly lived out immaturity and we ask you to forgive us. Uh, we don't blame each other. We simply ask you to come and make us different. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that you can take us spiritually immature people and help us to become mature. This is your goal, your desire, and I, I see that vision, Lord. I see it right here at Harvest where your people are finding their gifts. They're growing in their own personal relationship with you. The fruit's starting to be there, evident, and then we all start reaching out to our community and reaching out to each other. And, and you're glorified and your kingdom is advanced. Bring it about. We ask that you do it again. You're really good at this. 
do it again, God. Help us. Thank you, Lord. Let's, let's stand, and as we worship, I really do want to encourage you to just expect to experience the presence of the Lord and allow him to begin to do a work of maturity in your heart. denomination and he never fell 
He was a mature man of God, and he heard those words to grow up in Christ, get rid of the excuses, begin to dig in, let's grow. And, and someday, who knows, maybe the rapture will come soon. <laughs> someday, though, we're going to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. If you need prayer, we will have people right up here. Why don't you come up? People with yellow badges. We'll have people up front here ready to pray for you. Uh, if you see one uh, you know, out there, you, just, you can ask them too. If they got a badge, they're ready to pray for you, okay? And uh, we need each other. So we need prayer. We need to seek. We, need, we want to grow. So do that, okay? Uh, also, if you are interested in baptism, come and talk to one of these, and then they'll, they'll talk to me or whatever because we're having a baptism uh, in a couple weeks, you know, at the celebration service uh, if people want to get baptized. And, uh, um, but may God bless each and every one of you with his presence with the ability to abide in him and uh, with that maturity that comes with that. May he bless you this week even in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen.